principles of personal leadership. What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Please find a place to read the next few chapters where you can be alone and uninterrupted. Clear your mind of everything, expect what you will read, and what I will invite you to do. Don't worry about your schedule, your business, your family, or your friends. Just focus with me and really open your mind. In your mind's eyes, see yourself going to the funeral of a loved one. Picture yourself driving to the funeral parlor or a chapel, parking the car, and getting out. As you walk inside the building, you notice flowers, the soft organ music. You see the faces of the friends and family you pass along the way. You feel the shared sorrow of losing, loss, losing the joy of having known the radiance from the heart of the people there. As you walk down the front of the room and look inside the casket, you suddenly come face to face with yourself. This is your funeral. Three years from today, all these people have come to honor you, to express feelings of love and appreciation for your life. As you take a seat and wait for the service to begin, you look at the program in your hand. There are, to, there are to be four speakers. The first is from your family, immediate and also extended children, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents, who have come from all over the country to attend. The second speaker is one of your friends, someone who can give a sense of what you were as a person. The third speaker is from your work of, or profession. And the fourth is from your church or some community organization where you've been involved in service. Now, think deeply. What would you like each of the speakers to say about you in your life? What kind of husband, wife, father, mother would you like their words to reflect? What kind of son or daughter or cousin? What kind of friend? What kind of working associate? What character would you like them to have seen in you? What contributions, what achievements would you want them to remember? Look carefully at the people around you. What difference would you like to have made in their lives. Before you read further, take a few minutes to jot down your impressions. It will greatly increase your personal understanding of habit two. What it means to, quote, begin with the end in mind, quote. If you participated seriously in the visualization experience, you touched, you, you touched for a moment some of your deep fundamental values. You established brief, brief contact with the inner guidance system at your heart of the circle influence. Consider the words of Joseph Addison. When I look up the tombs of the great, every emotion of envy dies in me. When I read the epithets of the beautiful, every, in, every inordinate desire goes, away, goes out. When I meet with the grief of parents upon a tombstone, my heart melts with the compassion. When I see the tomb of the parents themselves, I consider the vanity of grieving for those whom we must quickly follow. When I see kings lying by those who despond, dispose them, when I consider rival wits placed side by side, or the holy men that divided the world with their contests and disputes, I reflect with sorrow and astonishment on the little competitions, factions, and debates of mankind. When I read the several dates of the tombs of some that died yesterday and some 600 years ago, I consider that great day when we shall all of us be contemporaries and make our appearances an, uh, together. Although habit two applies to many different circumstances and levels of life, the most fundamental application of, quote, begin with the end in mind, quote, is to begin today with the image picture of paradigm at the end of your life as your frame of reference or the criterion by which everything else is examined. Each part of your life today's be your life today your life, today's behavior, tomorrow's behavior, next week's behavior, next month's behavior, can be examined in the context of the whole of what really matters most to you. By keeping that, that end clearly in mind, you can make certain that when, whatever you do on any particular day does not violate the criteria you have defined as supremely important and that each day of your life contribute, contributes in a meaningful way to the vision you have of your life as a whole. To begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. It means to know where you're going so that you better understand where you are now and so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. It's incredibly easy to get caught up in the activity trap, in the busyness of life, to work harder and harder at climbing the ladder of success only to discover it's learning against the wrong wall. It's leaning against the wrong wall. It is possible to be busy, very busy, without being very effective. People often find themselves achieving victories that are empty successes, that have come come at the expense of things they suddenly realize were far more valuable than them. People from every walk of life, doctors, academic, ac academicians, actors, 
Politicians, business professionals, athletes, and plumbers often struggle to achieve a higher income, more recognition, or a certain criteria of professional competence, only to find that their drive to achieve their goal blinded them to the things that really mattered most and now are gone. How different our lives are when we really know what is deeply important to us, and keeping that picture in mind, we manage ourselves each day to be and to, not, and to do what really matters most. If the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. We may be very busy, we may be very efficient, but we will also be truly we also will be truly effective only when we begin with the end in mind. If you carefully consider what you wanted to be said what did you want it to be said of you in the funeral experience, you will find your definition of success. It may be very different from the definition you thought you had to in mind. Perhaps fame, achievement, money, or some sort of other things we strive for are not even part of the right wall. When you begin with the end in mind, you gain different perspective. One man asked another on the death of a mutual friend, how much did he leave? His friend responded, he left it all. All things are created twice. Begin with the end in mind is based on the principle that all things are created twice. There's a mental or first creation and a physical second creation to all things. Take the construction of a home, for example. You create it in a very detail, every detail before you ever hammer the first nail into place. You try to get a very clear sense of what kind of house you want. If you want a family-centered home, you plan to put a family room where it would be a natural gathering place. You plan sliding doors and a patio for children to play outside. You work with ideas, you work with your friends, your mind, until you get a clear image of what you want to build. Then you reduce it to a blueprint and develop construction plans, all of this done before the earth is touched. If not, then in the second creation, the physical creation, you will have to make expensive changes that may double the cost of your home. The carpenter's rule is measure twice, cut once. You have to make sure that that blueprint, the first creation, is really what you want, that you thought everything through. Then you put it into bricks and mortar. Each day you go to the construction shed and pull out the blueprint to get mar marching orders for the day. You begin with the end in mind. For another example, look at a business. If you want to have a successful enterprise, you clearly define what you're trying to accomplish. You carefully think through the product or service you want to provide in terms of the market target. Then you organize all the elements, financial research and development, operations and marketing, personal, physical, facilities, and so on. To meet that objective, the extent to which you begin with the end in mind often determines whether or not you are able to create a successful enterprise. More business failures begin in the first creation when problems such as undercapitalization, misunderstanding, or market of market, or the lack of a business plan. The same is true with parenting. If you want to raise responsible, self-disciplined children, you have to keep the end clearly in mind. As you interact with your children on a daily basis, you can't behave toward them in ways that undermine their self-discipline or self-esteem. To varying degrees, people use this principle in many different areas of life. Before you go on a trip, you determine your destination and plan out the best route. Before you plant a garden, you plan it out in your mind, possibly on paper. You create speeches on paper before you give them and envision the landscaping in your yard before the landscape. you landscape it. You design the clothes you make before you thread the needle. To the extent to which we understand the principles of two creations and accept the responsibility for both, we act within and, and, and enlarge the borders of our circle of influence. To the extent to which we do not operate in harmony with this principle and do not take charge of the first creation, we diminish it. By design or default, it's a principle that all things are created twice, but not all first creations are by conscious design. In our personal lives, if we do not develop our own self-awareness and do not become responsible for the first creations, we empower other people and circumstances outside our circle of influence to shape much of our lives by default. We reactively live the scripts handed to us by family, associates, other people, agendas, and pressures of circumstances, scripts from our earlier years from our training, our conditioning, these scripts come from people, not principles, and they rise out of our deep vulnerabilities, our deep dependencies on others, and our needs for acceptance and love, for belonging, for a sense of importance and worth, for feeling that we matter, of an matter. Whether we are aware of it or not, whether we are in control of it or not, there is a first creation to every part of our lives. We are either the second creation of our own proactive design 
or we are the second creation of others' agendas, of circumstances, or the past habits. The unique human capability of self-awareness, imagination, and consciousness enables us to examine first creations and make it possible for us to take charge of our own first creation, to write our own, our own script. Put another way, habit one says, you are the creation habit two, if the first creation. Leadership and management, the two creations. Habit two is based on the principles of personal leadership, which means that leadership is the first creation. Leadership is not management. Management is the second creation, which we'll discuss in chapter on habit three. But leadership has to come first. Management is a bottom line focus. How can I accomplish certain things? Leadership deals with the top line. What are the things I want to accomplish? In the words of both Peter Drucker and Warren Bennis, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. Management is efficiency in climbing the ladder of success. Leadership determines whether the ladder is leaning against the right wall. You can quickly grasp the important difference between the two if you envision a group of pr producers cutting their way through the jungle with mach machetes. They're the producers, the problem solvers. They're cutting through the undergrowth, clearing it out. The managers are behind them, sharpening their machetes, writing policy and procedure manuals, holding muscle development programs, bringing in improved technologies, and setting up working schedules and compensation programs for machete wielders. The leader is the one who climbs the tallest tree, surveys the entire situation, and yells, wrong jungle. But how do the busy, efficient producers and managers often respond? Shut up. You're making progress. We're making progress. As individuals, groups, businesses, individuals, groups, and businesses, we're often so busy cutting through the undergrowth, we don't even realize we're in the wrong jungle. And the rapidly changing environment in which we live makes effective leadership more critical than it has ever been in every aspect of independent and interdependent life. We are more in need of a vision or destination and a compass, a set of principles or directions, and less in need of a roadmap. We often don't know what the terrain ahead will be or what we will need to go through. Much will depend on our judgment at the time, but an inner compass will always give us direction. Effectiveness, often even survival, does not depend solely on how much effort we expend, but on whether or not the effort we expend is in the right jungle, and the metamorphosis taking place in, in, the most, in most every industry and profession demands leadership first and management second. In business, the market is changing so rapidly, many products and services that successfully met consumer tastes and needs a few years ago are obsolete today. Proactive, powerful leadership must constantly monitor environment changes particularly customer buying habits and motives and provide the force necessary to organize resources in the right direction. Such changes as deregulation of the airline industry, skyrocketing costs of health care, and the greater quality and quantity of imported cars impacts the environment in significant ways. If industries do not monitor the environment, including their own team own work their own work teams and exercise the creative leadership to keep headed in the right direction, no amount of management expertise can keep them from failing. Efficient management without effective leadership is, as one individual has phrased it, like straightening deck chairs on the Titanic. No management success can compensate for failure in leadership, but leadership is hard because we are often caught in a management paradigm. At the final session of a long, of a year-long executive development program in Seattle, the president of an oil company came up to me and said, Stephen, when you pointed out the difference between leadership and management in the second month, I looked at my role as the president at this company and realized that I had never been into leadership. I was deep into management, buried by pressing challenges in the details of day-to-day -day logistics, so I decided to withdraw from management. I couldn't, I could get other people to do that. I wanted to really lead my organization. It was hard. I went through withdrawal pains because I stopped dealing with a lot of the pressing, urgent matters that were right in front of me, and which gave me a sense of immediate accomplishment. I didn't receive much satisfaction. I started wrestling with the direction issues, the culture building issues, the deep analysis of problems, and seizing of new opportunities. Others also went through withdrawal pains from their working style, comfort zones. They missed the easy accessibility I had given them before. They still wanted me to be available to them, to respond to help solve their problems on a day-to-day -day basis. But I per persisted. I was absolutely convinced that I needed to provide leadership, and I did. Today, our whole business is different. We're more in line with our environment. We have doubled our revenues and quadrupled our profits. I'm into leadership. 
I'm convinced that too often parents are also trapped in the management paradigm, thinking of control efficiency, rules instead of directions, purpose and family and feelings, and leadership is even more lacking of our personal lives. We're into managing with efficiency, setting and achieving goals before we have made we have even clarified our values. Rescripting, becoming your own first creator. As we previously observed, proactivity is based on the unique human endowment of self-awareness. The two additional unique human endowments that enables us to expand our proactivity and to ex exercise personal leadership is our lives, our imagination, and conscious. Through imagination, we can visualize the uncreated worlds of potential that lie within us. Through conscious, we can come in contact with universal laws or principles with our own singular talent and avenues of contribution and with the personal guides within, a, within which we can most efficiently develop them. Combined with self-awareness, these two endowments empower us to write our own script. Because we already live with many scripts that have been handed to us, the process of writing our own script is actually more a process of rescripting or paradigm shifting of changing some of the basic paradigms that we already have. As we recognize the ineffective scripts, the incorrect or incomplete paradigms within us, we can proactively begin to rescript ourselves. I think one of the most inspiring accounts of the rescripting process comes from the autobiography of An Answat Sadat, past president of Egypt. Sadat was had been reared, nurtured, and deeply scripted in a hatred for Israel. He would make the statement on national television, I will never shake the hand of an Israeli, Israeli as long as I, as long as they occupy one inch of Arab or of so Arab soil. Never, never, never. And huge crowds all around the country would chant, never, never, never. He marshaled the energy and unified the will of the whole country in that script. The script was very independent and nationalistic, and it aroused deep emotions in the people. But it was also very foolish, and Sadat knew it. It, it ignored the perilous, highly interdependent reality of the situation. So he rescripted himself. It was a process he had learned when he was young, imprisoned in cell 54, a solitary cell in Cairo, central prison, as a result of his involvement in a conspiracy plot against King Farouk. He learned to withdraw from his own mind and look at it to see if the scripts were appropriate and wise. He learned how to vacate his own mind and through a deep personal process of mediation to work with his own scripture, his own form of prayer, and rescript himself. He records that he was almost loath to leave his prison cell because it was very it was there that he realized that real success is success with self. It's not in having things, but in having mastery, having victory over self. For a period of time during Nassar's administration, Sadat was regulated, re relegated to the position of relative insignificance. Everyone felt that his spirit was broken, but it wasn't. They were project projecting their own home movies onto him. They didn't understand him. He was bidding his time. And when that time came, when he became president of Egypt and confronted the political realities, he rescripted himself toward Israel. He visited the Nessa in Jerusalem and opened up one of the most precedent-breaking peace movements in the history of the world, a bold initiative that eventually brought about the Camp David Accord. Sadat was able to use his self-awareness, his imagination, and his conscience to ex exercise personal leadership, to change an essential paradigm, to change the way he saw the situation. He worked in the center of his circle of influence, and from that rescripting, that change of paradigm flowed changes in behavior and attitude that affected millions of lives in the wide circle of concern. In developing our own self-awareness, many of us discover ineffective scripts, deeply embedded habits that are totally unworthy of us, totally incongruent with the things we really value in life. Habit 2 says we don't have to live with those scripts. We are responsible to use our imagination and creativity to write new ones that are new, that are more effective, more congruent with our deep, deepest values and with the correct principles that give our values meaning. Suppose, for example, that I'm highly overreactive overreactive to my children. Suppose that whoever they begin to do, whenever they begin to do something, I feel is inappropriate. I sense an immediate te tensing to the pit of my stomach. I feel defensive. Walls go up. I prepare for battle. My focus is not on the long-term growth and understanding, but on the short-term behavior. I'm trying to win the battle, not the war. I pull out my ammunition, my superior size, my position of authority, and I yell or intimidate or I threaten or punish. And I win. I stand there victorious in the middle of the debris of a shattered relationship, while my children are outwardly submissive and inwardly rebellious. 
suppressing feelings that will come out later in uglier ways. Now, if I was sitting at that funeral we visualized earlier and one of my children was about to speak, I would want his life to represent the victory of teaching, training, and disciplining with love over a period of years rather than battle scars or quick fix skirmishes. I would want his heart and mind to be filled with the pleasant mo memories of deep, meaningful times together. I would want him to remember me as a loving father who shared the fun and the pain of growing up. I would want him to remember the times he came to me with his problems and concerns. I would want to have listened and loved and helped. I would have wanted him to know I wasn't perfect, but that I tried with everything I had, and that perhaps more than anybody in the world, I loved him. The reason I would want those things is because deep down, I value my children. I love them. I want to help them. I value my role as their father. I don't always see those values. I get caught up in the thick of the thing, thick of thick and thin, thick of thin things. What matters most gets buried under layers of pressing problems, immediate concerns, and outward behaviors. I become reactive, and the way I interact with my children every day often bears little resemblance to the way I deeply feel about them, because I am self-aware, because I am at, have imagination and conscience. I can examine my deepest values. I can realize that the script I'm living in is not in harmony with those values that my life is not the product of my own proactive design, but the result of the first creation. I have deferred to circumstances and other people. I can change. I can live out my imagination instead of my memory. I can tie myself to my limitless potential instead of my limiting past. I can become my own first creator. To begin with the end in mind means to approach my role as a parent as well as my ro other roles in life with my values and directions clear. It means to be responsible for my own first creation, to rescript myself to that paradigm from which my behavior and attitude flow are congruent with my deepest values and in harmony with correct principles. I also, it also means to begin each day with those values firmly in mind. This is a vicissitudes as the challenges come. I can make my decisions based on those values. I act with integrity. I don't have to react to emotion, the circumstance. I can be truly proactive, value-driven, because my values are clear. A personal mission statement. The most effective way I know to begin in the end in mind is to develop a personal mission statement, or philosophy, or creed. It f focuses on what you want to be, character, and to do, contributions and achievements, and on the values or principles upon which being and doing are based. Because each individual is unique personal mission statement will will reflect that uniqueness both in content and form. My friend Rolf Kerr has expressed his personal creed in this way. Succeed at home first. Seek and merit divine help. Never compromise with honesty. Remember the people involved. Hear both sides before judging. Obtain counsel of others. Defend those who are absent. Be sincere yet decisive. Develop one new proficiency a year. Plan tomorrow's work today. Hustle while you wait. Maintain a positive attitude. Keep a sense of humor. Be orderly in person and work. Do not fear mistakes. Fear only the absence of creativity, constructive and corrective response to those mistakes. Facilitate the success of the subordinate. Listen twice as much as you speak. Concentrate all habit, abilities, and efforts on the task at hand, not worrying about the next job or promotion. A woman seeking a balanced family and work values has expressed her sense of personal mission differently. I will seek to balance my career and family as best as I, as I can since both are important to me. My home will be a place where I and my family, friends, and guests find joy, comfort, peace, and happiness. Still, I will seek to create a clean and orderly environment, yet livable and comfortable. I will exercise wisdom in what we choose to eat, read, see, do at home. I especially want to teach my children to love and learn and to laugh and to work and develop their unique talents. I value the rights, freedom, and responsibility of our democratic society. I will be concerned and informed citizen, involved in the political process to ensure my voice is heard and my vote is counted. I will be a self-starting individual who exercises initiatives in accomplishing my life goals. I will act on situations and opportunities rather than be acted upon. I will always be... I will always try to keep myself free from addictive and destructive habits. I will develop habits that free me from old labels and limits that and expand my capabilities and choices. My money will be my servant, not my master. I will seek financial independence over time. My wants will be subject to my needs and, need and, the, and my means. Except for long-term home and car loans, I will seek to keep myself free from consumer debt. 
I will spend less than I earn and regularly save or invest part of my income. Moreover, I will use that money and talents I have to make life more enjoyable for others through service and charitable giving. You could call a personal mission statement a personal constitution, like the United States Constitution. It's fundamentally changeless. In over 200 years, there have been only 26 amendments, 10 of which were in the original Bill of Rights. The United States Constitution is the standard by which every law in the country is evaluated. If it is the document the president agrees to defend and support when he takes oath of office. It is the criterion for, by, which, wh by which people are admitted into citizenship. It is the foundation and the center that enables people to ride through such major traumas as, as the Civil War, Vietnam, or Watergate. It is the written standard, the key criteria by which everything else is evaluated and directed. The Constitution has endured and serves its vital function today because it is based on correct principles, on self-evident truths contained in the Declaration of Independence. These principles empower the Constitution with a timeless strength, even in the midst of social ambiguity and change. Our peculiar security, said Thomas Jefferson, is the possession of the written Constitution. A personal mission statement based on the correct principles becomes the same kind of standard for an individual. It becomes a personal constitution, the basis for making major life-directing decisions, the basis for daily decisions in the midst of the circumstances and emotions that affect our lives. It empowers individuals with the same timeless strength in the midst of change. People can't live without change, with change, if there's not a changeless core inside them. The key to the ability to change is a changeless sense of who you are, what you are about, and what you value. With a mission statement, we can flow with changes. We don't need prejudgments or prejudices. We don't need to figure out everything else in life to stereotype and categorize everything and everybody in order to accommodate reality. Our personal environment is also changing at every, at ever-increasing pace. Such rapid change burns out a large number of people who feel they can hardly handle it, can hardly cope with the life. They become reactive and essentially give up hoping that the things that happen to them will be good. But it doesn't have to be that way. In the Nazi death camps, while Viktor Frankl learned the principles of proactivity, he also learned the importance of purpose and meaning in his life. The essence of the logotherapy, the philosophy that he later developed and taught, is that many so-called mental and emotional illnesses are really symptoms of an underlying sense of meaningless or emptiness. Logotherapy eliminates the emptiness by helping the individual to detect his unique meaning, his mission in life. Once you have the sense of mission, you have the essence of your own proactivity. You have the vision and the values which, you, which direct your life. You have the basic direction from which you set your long and short-term goals. You have the power of a written consultation, constitution based on correct principles against which every decision concerning the most effective use of your time, your talents, and your energies can be effectively measured. At the center. In order to write personal mission statements, we must begin at a very center of our circle of influence, that center composed of our most basic paradigms, the lens through which we see the world. It is here that we deal with our vision and our values. It is here that we use our endowment of self-awareness to examine our maps, and if we value correct principles, to make certain that our maps accurately describe the territory that our paradigms are based on principles and reality, it is here that we use our endowment of conscious and a, as a compass to help us detect our unique talents and our areas of contribution. It is here that we use our endowment of imagination, mentally create an end we desire giving direction and purpose to our beginning and in provi providing the substance of a written personal constitution. It is also here that our focus efforts achieve the greatness, greatness results as we work within the very center of our circle of influence. We expand it. This is the highest leverage PC work significantly imparting the effectiveness of every aspect of our lives. Whatever it is at the center of our lives will be the source of our security guidance, wisdom, and power. Security represents your sense of worth, your identity, emotional an anchorage, your self-esteem, your basic personal strength, or lack of it. Guidance means your source of direction in life encompassed by the your map, your internal frame of reference that interprets for you what is happening out there, and standards or principles or implicit criteria that govern moment by moment decision making and doing. Wisdom is your perspective on life, your sense of balance, your understanding of how the various parts and principles apply and, un and relate to each other. It embraces judgment, discriminant, comprehension. It is the gestalt of oneness 
at integrated wholeness power is the faculty or capacity to act the strength the potency to accomplish something it is the vital energy to make choices and decisions it also includes the capacity to overcome deeply embedded habits and to cultivate higher more effective ones these four hab factors security guidance wisdom and power are interdependent security and clear guidance bring true wisdom and wisdom becomes the spark for catalyst to release and and release and direct power when these four factors are present together harmonized and and live livened by each other, they create the great force of the noble personality, a balanced character, a beautifully integrated individual. These life support factors also under, undergrid every other dimension of life, and none of them in all or, or nothing matters. The degree to which you have developed each one could be charted somewhere on a continuum. Much like the maturity continuum described earlier, at the bottom end of, of four factors are weak. You are basically dependent on circumstances or other people, things other, uh, things over which you have no direct control. At the top end, you are in control. You have independent strength and the foundation for rich interdependent relationships. Your security lies somewhere on the continuum between the extremes and security on one end, wherein your life is buffeted by, by all the fickle forces that play upon it, and a deep sense of high intrinsic worth and personal security on the other end. Your guidance ranges on the continuum from dependence on the social mirror or other un unstable, fun fluctuating sources to strong inner direction. Your wisdom falls somewhere between a totally inaccurate map where everything is distorted and nothing seems to fit and a complete and accurate map of life wherein all parts and principles are properly related to each other. Your power lies somewhere between immobilization or be being a puppet pulled by someone else's strings to high proactivity the power to act according to your own values instead of being acted upon by other people and circumstances. The location of these factors on the continuum, the resulting degree of their integration, harmony and balance, and their positive impact on every aspect of your life is a function of your center, the basic paradigms of your very core. Alternative centers. Each of us has a center, though we usually don't recognize it as it is such. Neither do we recognize the all-encompassing effects of that center on every aspect of our lives. Let's briefly examine several centers or core paradigms people typically have for a better understanding of how they affect these four fundamental dimensions and ultimately the sum of life that flows from them. Spouse-centeredness. Marriage can be the most intimate, the most satisfying, the most enduring, growth-producing of human relationships. It might seem natural and proper to be centered on one's husband or wife, but experience and observation tell a different story. Over the years, I have been involved in working with many troubled marriages, and I have observed a certain thread weaving itself through almost every spouse-centered relationship. I have encountered that thread is strong emotional dependence. If our sense of emotional worth comes to primarily from our marriage, then we become highly dependent upon the relationship. We become vulnerable to the moods, the feelings, the behavior, and the treatment of our spouse or to any external event that may impinge on the relationship, a new child in laws, in laws, economic setbacks, social successes, and so forth. When responsibilities increase and stresses come in to come into marriage, we tend to revert to the scriptures we were given as we were growing up. But does our spouse and those scripts are usually different? Different ways of handling financial child, financial child discipline or in law issues come to the surface. When these deep-seated tendencies combine with the emotional dependency in the marriage, the spouse-centered relationship reveals all its vulnerability. When we are dependent on the person with whom we are in conflict, both need a conflict and compound it. Love, hate, or overreaction, fight or flight tendencies, withdrawal, aggressiveness, bitterness, resentment, and cold competition are some of the usual results. When these occur, we tend to fall even farther back on the background tendencies and habits in an effort to justify and defend our own behavior and we attack our spouses. Inevitably, anytime we are too vulnerable, we feel the need to protect ourselves from further wounds. So we resort to sarcasm, cutting humor, criticism, anything that will keep from exposing the tenderness within. Each partner tends to, to wait on the initiative of the other for love, only to be disappointed but all confirmed as the rightness of the acute accusations made. There is only phantom security in such a relationship. When all appears to be going well, guidance is based on the emotion of the moment. Wisdom and power are lost in the content 
counter-dependent negative interactions. Family centeredness. Another common center is the family. This too may seem to be natural and proper as an area of focus and deep investment. It provides great opportunities for deep relationships, for loving, for sharing, for much that makes life worthwhile. But as a center, it ironically destroys the very elements necessary to family success. People who are family-centered get their sense of security or personal worth from the family tradition and culture of the family reputation. Thus, they become vulnerable to any change in that tradition or culture and to any influence that would affect the reputation. Family-centered parents do not have the emotional freedom, the power to raise the children with their ultimate welfare truly in mind. If they derive their own security from the family, their need to be popular with their children may override the importance of the long-term investment in their children's growth and development, or they may be focused on the proper and correct behavior of the moment. Any behavior that they consider improper threatens their security. They become upset, guided by emotions of the moment, spontaneously reacting to immediate concern rather than long-term growth and development of the child. They may yell or scream. They may overreact and punish out the bad temper. They tend to love their children conditionally, making them emotionally dependent or counter-dependent and rebellious. Money-centeredness. Another logical and extremely common center to people's lives is the making money. Economic security is a basic to one's opportunity to do much in any other dimension in the hierarchy of the continuum of needs. Physical survival and financial security comes first. Other needs are even activated, aren't even activated until that basic need is satisfied at least minimally. Most of the face, most of us face economic worries. Many forces in the wider culture can and do act upon our economic situation, causing or threatening and disruption, such disruption that we often experience concern and worry that may not always rise to the conscious surface. Sometimes. There are apparently noble reasons given for making money, such as the desire to take care of one's family, and these things are important, but to focus on money making as a center to bring about its own undoing? Consider again the four life support factors. Security, guidance, wisdom, and power. Suppose I derive much of my security from my employment, or from my income or net worth. Since many uneasy, protective, and defensive about anything, about anything that may affect them. When my sense of personal worth comes from the net worth, I am vulnerable to anything that will affect that net worth. But work and money per se, per se provide no wisdom, no guidance, and only a limited degree of power and security. All it takes to show the limitations of money center is a crisis in my life or in the life of a loved one. Money-centered people often put aside family or other priorities, assuming everyone will understand that economic demands come first. I know one father who was leaving with his children from a, for a promised trip to the circus when a phone call came for him to come to work instead. He declined. When his wife suggested that perhaps he should have gone to work, he responded, The work will come again, but childhood won't. For the rest of their lives, his children remembered this little act of priority, setting not only the object lesson in their minds, but an expression of love in their hearts. Work-centeredness. Work-centered people may become work alcohol- workaholics driving themselves to produce a sacrifice at the sacrifice of the health relationships and other important areas of their lives. Their fundamental identity comes from their work. I'm a doctor. I'm a writer. I'm an actor. Because their identity and self-worth are wrapped up in their work, their security is vulnerable to anything that happens to prevent them from continuing it. Their guidance is a function of the demands of the work. Their wisdom and power come in the limited areas of their work, rendering them ineffective in, the, in the other areas of life. Possession-centeredness. A driving force of many people is possessions, not only tangible material possessions, such as fashionable clothes, homes, cars, boats, and jewelry, but also the intangible possessions of fame, glory, or social prominence. Most of us are aware, through our own experience, how singularly flawed such a center is, simply because it can vanish rapidly and it is influenced by so many forces. If my sense of security lies in my reputation or in the things I have in my life, I, my life have, my life will be in a constant state of threat and jeopardy, and these possessions may be lost or stolen or devalued. If I'm in the presence of someone of greater net worth or fame or status, I feel inferior. If I'm in the presence of someone of lesser net worth or fame or status, I feel superior. My sense of self-worth constantly fluctuates. I don't have any sense of constancy. constancy or anchorage, or persistent selfhood. 
I am constantly trying to protect and ensure my assets, property, securities, positions, or reputations. We have all heard stories of people committing suicide after losing their fortunes in a significant stock decline or their fame in a political reversal. Pleasure-centeredness. Another common center closely allied with possessions is that of a fun and that of fun and pleasure. We live in a world where instant gratification is available and encouraged. Television and movies are major influences in increasing people's expectations. They graphically portray what other people have and can do in living their life of ease and fun. But while the glitter of pleasure-centered lifestyles is graphically portrayed, the natural result of such lifestyles, the impact on their interpersonal productivity or relationships, is seldom accurately seen. Innocent pleasures in moderation can provide relaxation for the body and mind and can foster family and other relationships. But pleasure, per se, offers no deep, lasting satisfaction or sense of fulfillment. The pleasure-centered person, too, soon bored with each succeeding succeeding level of fun, constantly cries for more and more. So, the next new pleasure has to be bigger. The better, more exciting, with bigger high. A person in this state becomes almost entirely narcissistic, interpreting all of life in terms of pleasure. It provides the self here and now. Too many vacations that last too long, too many movies, too much TV, too much video game playing, too much undisciplined leisure, time in which a person continually takes the course of least resistance, gradually wastes its life. It ensures that a person's capacity stay dormant, that talents remain undeveloped, that the mind and the spirit become lethargic, and the heart is unfulfilled. Where is the security, guidance, wisdom, and power at the low end of the continuum, in the pleasure of a fleeting moment? Malcolm Mudridge writes in a 20th century testimony, When I look back on my life nowadays, which I sometimes do, what strikes me most for- forcibly about it is what seemed at the time most significant and seductive, seems now most futile and a bit absurd. For instance, success in all of its various gu- guises, being known and being praised, ostensible pleasures like acquiring money, or seducing women, or traveling, going and fro in the world and up and down in it like Satan, explaining the experiencing, explaining and experiencing whatever Vanity Fair has to offer. It, in retrospect, all of these exercises in self gratification seem pure fantasy. What Pascal called licking the earth. Friend enemy centeredness. Young people are particularly, though certainly not exclusively, susceptible to becoming friend centered. Acceptance and belonging to a peer group can come can become almost supreme important. The distorted and ever-changing social mirror becomes the source of the four life life support factors, creating a high degree of dependence on the fluctuating moods, feeling attitudes and behaviors of others. Friend-centeredness can also focus exclusively on one person taking on some of the dimensions of marriage. The emotional dependence on on one individual and the escalating need conflict spiral and the resulting negative interactions can grow out of the friend-centeredness. And what about putting an enemy at the center of one's life? Most people who never think of it, and probably no one would ever do it consciously, nevertheless, enemy centering is very common, particularly when there is a frequent interaction between people who are in real conflict. When someone feels he has been unjustly dealt with, dealt with by an emotionally or socially significant person, it is very easy for him to become occupied with the injustice and make the other person the center of his life. Rather than proactively leading his own life, the enemy-centered person is counterdependently reacting to the behavior and attitudes of a perceived enemy. One friend of mine who taught at a university became very distraught because of the weaknesses of a particular administrator with whom he had a negative relationship. He allowed himself to think about the man constantly until eventually it became an obsession. It so preoccupied him that it affected the quality of his relationships with his family, his church, and his working associates. He finally came to the conclusion that he had to leave the university and accept a teaching appointment somewhere else. Wouldn't you really prefer to teach at this university if the, ma- if the man were not here? I asked him. Yes, I would, he responded. But as long as he is here, then my staying is too disruptive to everything in my life. I have to go. Why have you made this administrator the center of your life? I asked him. He was shocked by the question. He denied it but I pointed out to him that he was allowing one individual and his weaknesses to distort his entire map of life, to undermine his faith and the quality of his relationship with his loved ones. He finally admitted that the individual had had such an impact on him, but he denied that he himself had made all these choices. 
he attributed the responsibility for the unhappy situation to the administrator. He himself, he declared, was not responsible. As we walk, as we talked, little by little, he came to realize, came to realize that he was in the deed responsible. But that, but that because he did not handle this responsibility well, he was being irresponsible. Many divorced people fall into a similar pattern. They are still consumed with anger and bitterness and self-justification regarding an ex-spouse. In a negative sense, psychologically, they are still married. They each need the weakness of the former partner to justify their accusations. Many older children go through life either secretly or openly hating their parents. They blame them for past abuses, neglect, or favoritism, and they center their adult life on that hatred, living out the reactive justifying script that accompanies it. The individual who is friend or enemy centered has no intrinsic security, feeling or self-worth are volatile, a function of the emotional state or behavior of the world. Guidance comes from the person's perception of how others will respond, and wisdom is limited by the social lens of, or by an enemy-centered paranoia. The individual has no power. Only people are pulling the strings. Church-centeredness. I believe the most anyone who is seriously involved in any church will recognize that church-going is not synonymous with personality, personal spirituality. There are some people who get, to, get to, so busy in church worship and projects that they become intensive, insensitive to the pressing human needs that surround them, contradicting the very pre precepts they profess to believe deeply. There are other, others who attend church less frequently or not at all, but whose attitudes and behaviors reflect more genuine centering in the principles of the basic Judeo-Christian ethic. Having participated throughout my life in organized church and community service groups, I have found that attending church does not necessarily mean living the principles taught in those meetings. You can be inactive in a church, but inactive in the gospel. In the church-centered life, image or appearance can become a person's dominant consideration, leading to hypocrisy that undermines personal security and intrinsic worth. Guidance comes from the social conscious and the church-centered person, tends to label other artificially, art, others artificially in terms of active, inactive, liberal, orthodox, or conservative. Because the church is a formal organization made up of policies, programs, practices, and people, it cannot be itself give a person by itself give a person a, any deep permanent security or sense of intrinsic worth. Living the principles taught by the church can do this, but organization alone cannot. Nor can the church give a person a constant sense of guidance. Church-centered people often tend to live in compa compartments, acting and thinking and feeling in certain ways of the on the Sabbath, and in totally different ways on the weekdays. Such a lack of wholeness or Such an act of wholeness or unity or integrity is a further threat to security, creating the need for increased labeled, labeling and self-justifying. Seeing the church as an end rather than as a, as a means to an end undermines a person's wisdom and sense, balance, sense of balance. Although the church claims to teach people about the source of power, it does not claim to be the power itself. It claims to be one vehicle through which divine power can be channeled into man's nature. Self-centeredness. Perhaps the most common center today is the self. The most obvious form is self selfishness, which violates the values of most people. But if we look closely at many of the popular approaches to growth and self-fulfillment, we often find self-centering at their core. There is little security, guidance, wisdom, or power in limited center of self. Like the Dead Sea in Palestine, it accepts about never it accepts, but it never gives. It becomes stagnant. On the other hand, paying attention to the development of the self in the greater perspective of improving one's ability to serve, to produce, to contribute, contribute to, in meaningful ways, gives context for dramatic increase in the form for life support factors. These are some of the more, more common centers from which people approach life. It is often much easier to recognize center in someone's life than to see it in your own. You probably know someone who puts making money ahead of everything else. You probably know someone whose energy is devoted to justifying his or her position in an ongoing negative relationship. If you look, you can sometimes see beyond behavior into the center that creates it. Identifying your center. But where do you stand? What is the center of your life? Sometimes that isn't easy to see. Perhaps the best way to identify your own center is to look 
closely at your life support factors. If you can identify with one of one or more of the descriptions below, you can trace it back to the center from which it flows, a center which may be limited your personal effectiveness. More often than not, a person's center is some combination of these and or other centers. More com most common are very much a function of a variety of influences that plays upon their lives. Depending on the external or internal conditions, one particular center may act may be activated until the underlying needs are satisfied. Then another center becomes the compelling force. As a person fluctuates from one center to another, the resulting relativism is like roller coasting, roller coasting through life. One moment you're high, the next moment you're low, making effort to comp compensate for one's weakness by borrowing strength from another weakness. There is no consistent sense of direction, no persistent wisdom, no steady power supply or sense of personal intrinsic worth and identity. The ideal course is to create our one clear center from which you consistently derive a high degree of security, guidance, and wisdom. Empower, empowering and proactively giving congruency and harmony to every part of your life. A principal center. By centering our lives or correct principles, we create a solid foundation for development of our life, our four life support factors. Our security comes from knowing that unlike other centers based on people or things, which are subject to frequent and immediate change, correct principles do not change. We can depend on them. Principles don't react to anything. They don't get mad and treat us differently. They don't divorce us or run away with our best friend. They aren't out to get us. They can't prave, pave our way with shortcuts and quick fixes. <clears throat> they don't depend on the behavior of others in the environment or the current fa fad for their validity. Principles don't die. They aren't here one day and gone the next. They can't be destroyed by fire, earthquake, or theft. Principles are deep, fundamental truths, classic truths, generic common denominators. They are tightly interwoven threads running with ex exactness, consistently beauty, strength through the fabric of life. Even in the midst of people or circumstance, they seem to ignore the principles that seem to ignore the principles, we can be secure to this knowledge that principles are bigger than people or circumstances, and that thousands of years of history have seen them triumph. Time and time again, even more important, we can be secure in the knowledge that we can validate them in our own lives, by our own people and experiences. Admittedly, we're not omniscient. Our knowledge and understanding for correct principles is limited by our own lack of awareness of the, our true nature and of the world around us, and by the flood of the trendy philosophies and theories that are not in harmony with correct principles. These ideas will have their season of acceptance, but like many up before them, they, don't, they won't endure because they're built on false foundations. We are limited, but we can push back the borders of our limitations and understanding of the principles of our own growth enables us to search out correct principles with the confidence that the more we learn, the more clearly we can focus the lens through which we see the world. The principles don't change. Our understanding of them does. The wisdom and guidance that accompany principle-centered lives, living, come from the correct maps, from the ways we really are, have been, and will be. Correct maps enable us to clearly see where we want to go and how to get there. We can make our decisions using the correct data that will make their implementation possible and meaningful. The personal power that comes from principle-centered lives is the power of a self-aware, knowledgeable, proactive individual unrestricted by the attitudes, behaviors, and actions of others, or by many of the circumstances and environmental influences that limit other people. The only real limitation of power is the natural consequences of the principles themselves. We are free to choose our actions based on our knowledge or correct principles but we are not free to choose the consequences of those actions. Remember, if you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the other. Principles always have natural consequences attached to them. There are positive consequences when we live in harmony with the principles. There are negative consequences when we ignore them. But because their principles apply to everyone, whether or not they are aware, the limitation is universal. And more know of correct principles, the greater is our personal freedom to act wisely. By centering our lives on timeless, unchanging principles, we create a fundamental paradigm of effective living. In it is the center that puts all of us, all other centers, in perspective. Remember that your paradigm is the source from which your attitudes and behaviors flow. A paradigm is like a pair of glasses. 
It affects the way you see everything in your life. If you look at things through the paradigm or correct, of correct principles, what you see in life is dramatically different from what you see through any other centered paradigm. I have included in the appendix section of this book a detailed chart which shows how each centered how center we discussed might possibly affect the way you see everything else. But for a quick understanding of the difference your center makes, let's look at just one example of a specific problem as seen through the different paradigm. As you read, to try and put on each pair of glasses. Try to feel the response that flows from the different centers. Suppose tonight you have invited your wife to go to a concert. You have the tickets. She's excited about going. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. All of a sudden, your boss calls you into, into his office and says he needs you to help through the evening to get ready for an important meeting at 9 a.m. tomorrow. If you're looking through spouse-centered or family-centered glasses, your main concern will be your wife. You may tell the boss you can't stay and you take her to the concert in an effort to please her. You may feel you have to stay to protect your job, but you do so grudgingly anxious about her response, trying to justify your decision and protect yourself from her disappointment or anger. If you're looking through the money-centered lens, your main thought will be in be over the over be over the overtime you'll get or the influence working late will have on a potential raise. You may call your wife and simply tell her that you have to stay, assuming she'll understand the economic demands come first. If you're work-centered, you may be thinking of the opportunity you can learn more about the job. You can make some points with the boss and further your career. You may give yourself a pat on the back for putting in hours well beyond that is required. Evidence of what a hard worker you are. Your wife should be proud of you. If you're possession-centered, you might be thinking of the things that overtime income could buy. Or you might consider what an asset to your reputation at the office it would be if you stayed. Everyone would hear tomorrow how noble, how sacrificing, how dedicated you are. If you're pleasure-centered, you'll probably, you probably, you'll probably can the work and go home to the concert, even if your wife would be happy for you to work late. You deserve a night out. If you're friend-centered, your decision would be influenced by whether or not you had invited friends to attend the concert with you, or whether your friends at work were going to stay late too. If you're enemy-centered, you may stay late because you know it will give you a big edge over the person in the office who thinks he's the company's greatest asset. While he's off having fun, you'll be working and slaving, doing his work and yours, sacrificing your personal pleasure for the good of the company he can so blithely ignore. If you're church-centered, you might be influenced by the plans other church members have to attend the concert, by whether or not any church members work at the office, by the na nature of the concert. Hansel's Messiah might rate higher priority than a rock concert. Your decision might also be affected by what you think a good church member would do and by whether your view the extra work as a service or seeking after material wealth. If you're self-centered, you'll be focused on what will do you the most good. Would it be better for you to go out for the evening or would it be better for you to make a few points with the boss? How the different options affect you will be your main concern. As we consider various ways of looking at a single event, it is anyone it, it is any wonder that we have young lady, old lady perception problems in our interactions with each other. Can you see how fundamentally our centers affect us? Write down our motivate write down to our motivations, our daily decisions, our actions, or in too many cases our reactions, our interpretations of events. That's why understanding your own center is so important, and if that center does not empower you as a proactive person, it becomes fundamental to your effectiveness to make the necessary paradigm shift to create a center that will. As a principle-centered person, you try to stand apart from the emotion of the situation and from others, other factors that would act on you and evaluate options. Looking at the balanced whole, the work needs the family. The family needs needs, others' needs that may be involved and the possible implications of various alternative decisions. You'll try to come up with the best solution, taking all factors into consideration. Whether you go to the concert or stay at work is really a small part of the affected decision. You might make the sum choice with the number of other centers, but there are several important differences when you are coming from a principle-centered paradigm. First, you are not being acted upon by other people or circumstances. You are proactively choosing what you determine to be the best alternative. You make your decision consciously and knowledgeably. Second, 
you know your decision is most effective because it is a based on it is based on a principle with predictable long term results. Third, what you choose to do contributes to your ultimate values in life. Staying at work to get the edge on someone at the office is an entirely different evening in your life from staying because you value your boss's effectiveness and you genuinely want to contribute to the company's welfare. The experiences you have as you carry out your decisions take a quality and meaning in the context of your life as a whole. Fourth, you can communicate to your wife and your boss within the strong networks you've created in your interdependent relationships. Because you are independent, you can be effectively interdependent. You might decide to delegate what is the dele- delegable and come in early the next morning to do the rest. And finally, you'll feel comfortable about your decisions. Whatever, whatever you choose to do, you can focus on it and enjoy it. As a principle-centered person, you see things differently, and because you see things differently, you think differently. You act differently because you have a high degree of security guidance, wisdom, and power that flows from a solid, unchanging core. You have a foundation of a highly proactive and highly effective life. Writing and using personal mission statement. As we go deeply within ourselves, as we understand and realign our basic paradigms to bring them in harmony with correct principles, we create both an effective empowering center and a clear lens through which we can see the world. We can then focus the lens on how we, as unique individuals, relate to the world. Frankel says we detect rather than invent. Limit our missions in life. I like that choice of words. I think each of us has an internal monitor or sense, a conscious, that gives us an awareness of our own uniquenesses and the singular contributions that we can make in, in repeated in Frankel's words. Everyone has his own specific vocation or mission in life. Therein, he cannot be replaced, nor can his life be repeated. Thus, everyone's task is a unique as is his specific opportunity to implement it. In seeking to give verbal expression to the uniqueness, we are again reminded of the fundamental importance of proactivity and of working within our circle of influence. To see some abstract meaning to our lives out of in our circle of concern it is, abdicate, is to abdicate our proactive responsibility to place our own first creation in the hands of circumstances and other people. Our meaning comes from within. Again, in the words of Frankel, Ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather must recognize that it, that it is he who is asked. In a word, each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by responsible. Personal responsibility or proactivity is fundamental to the first creation. Returning to the computer metaphor, habit one says, you are the programmer. Habit two then says, write the program. Until you accept the idea of, of you are responsible that you are the programmer, you won't really invest in the writing the program. As proactive people, we can begin to give expression to what we want to be and do in our lives. We can write a personal mission statement and a personal constitution. A mission statement is not something you write overnight. It takes deep introspection, careful analysis, thoughtful expression, and often many rewrites to produce it in its final form. In it, it, in it, it in final form. It may take you several weeks or even months before you feel really comfortable with it, before you feel it is a complete and con- concise expression of your innermost values and directions, even when you will want to renew it regularly and make minor changes as the years bring additional insights or changing in circumstances. But fundamentally, your mission statement becomes your constitution, the solid expression of your vision, the value it becomes, the criteria by which you measure everything else in your life. I recently finished reviewing my own mission statement, which I do fairly regularly. Sitting on the edge of a beach alone at the end of a bicycle ride, I took out my organizer and hammered it out. It took several hours, but I felt a sense of clarity, a sense of organization and commitment, a sense of exhilaration and freedom. I find the process is as important as the product. Writing and reviewing a mission statement changes you because it forces you to think through your priorities deeply and carefully to align your behavior with your beliefs. As you do, others begin. As you do, other people begin to sense that you're not being driven by everything that happens to you. You have a sense of mission about what you're trying to do, and you're excited about it. Using your whole brain, our self awareness empowers us to examine our own thoughts. This is particularly helpful in creating a personal mission statement 
because the two unique human endowments that enable us to practice habit two, imagination and conscious, are primarily functions the right that of functions of the right side of the brain. Understanding how to tap into the right brain capacity greatly increases our first creation ability. A great deal of research has been two ways to tap the right brain. If we use the brain dominance theory as a model, it becomes evident that the quality of our first creation is significantly impacted by our ability to use your creative right brain. The more we are able to draw upon our right brain capacity, the more fully we will be able to visualize the synthesis to transcend time and present circumstances to project a holistic picture of what we want to do and to be in our lives. Expand perspective. Sometimes we are knocked out of our left brain environment and thought patterns and into the right brain by an unplanned experience. The death of a loved one, a severe illness, a financial setback, an extreme adversity can cause us to stand back, look at our lives, and ask ourselves some hard questions. What's really important? Why am I doing what I'm doing? But if your perspective, if you're proactive, you don't have to wait for circumstances or other people to create perspective expanding experiences. You can consciously create your own. There are a number of ways to do this. Through the powers of your imagination, you can visualize your own funeral as we did at the beginning of this chapter. We write our eology, actually write it out, be specific. You can visualize your 20th, 25th and then your 50th wedding anniversary. How your spouse visualizes with you this, how your spouse visualize this with you. Try to capture the essence of your family relationship and what relationship you want to have created through your day by day investment over a period of that many years. You can visualize your retirement from your present occupation. What contributions, what achievements will you want to have made? Your field. What plans will you have after retirement? Will you enter a second career? Expand your mind. Visualize in rich detail. Involve as many emotions and feelings as possible. Involve as many of the senses as you can. I have done similar visualization exercises with some of my ver of my university classes. Assume you only have this one semester to live tell my students and that during the semester you were to stay in school as a good student visualize how you would spend your semester things are suddenly placed in a different perspective values quickly surface that before weren't even recognized i've also asked students to live with the expanded perspective for a week and keep a diary of their experiences the results and their very are very revealing they start writing to parents to tell them how much they love and appreciate them. They reconcile with a brother, a sister, or a friend where the relationship has deteriorated. The dominant central theme of their activities and underlying principles is love. The futility, futility of bad-mouthing, bad-thinking, put-downs, and accusations becomes very evident when they think in terms of having only a short time to live. Principles and values become more evident to everybody. There are a number of techniques using your imagination that can put you in touch with your values, but the net effect of every one I have ever used is the same. When people seriously undertake to identify what really matters, most of them in their lives take, the ident identify, take to identify what, we, what really matters most to them in their lives, what, really, what, we, what they really want to be, to be and how to do. They become very rever reverent. They start thinking in larger terms than today and tomorrow. Visualization and Affirmation Personal leadership is not a singular experience. It doesn't begin and end with the writing of a personal mission statement. It is, rather, the ongoing process of keeping your vision and values before you and aligning your value to be congruent with those most important things. And in that effort, your powerful right brain capacity can be a great help to you on a daily basis as you work to integrate your personal mission statement into your life. It's another application of begin with the end in mind. Let's go back to an example we mentioned before. Suppose I'm a parent who really deeply loves my children. Suppose I identify that as one of my fundamental values in my personal mission statement, but suppose on a daily basis I have trouble because I overreact. I can use my right brain of visualization to write an affirmation that will help me become more congruent with my deeper values in my daily life. A good affirmation has five basic ingredients. It's personal, it's positive, it's present tense, it's visual and emotional. So I might write something like this. It is deeply satisfying that I respond with wisdom, love, firmness, and self-control when my children misbehave. Then I can visualize it. I can spend a few minutes each day and totally relax my mind and body. I can think about my situations in which my children might misbehave. I can visualize them in rich detail. I can feel the texture of the chair I might be sitting on 
the floor under my feet, the sweater I'm wearing. I can see the dress my daughter has on, the expression on her face. The more clearly and vividly I imagine the detail, the more deeply I will experience it, the less I will see it as a spectator. Then I can see her do something very specific, which normally makes my heart pound and my temper start to flare. But instead of seeing my normal response, I can see myself handle the situation with all the love, the power, the self-control I captured in my affirmation. I can write the program, write the script in harmony with my values, with my personal mission statement. And if I do this day after day, my behavior will change. Instead of living out of the scripts given to me by my own parents or by my society or by my genetics or my environment, I will be living out of the script I have written from my own self-selected value system. I have helped and encouraged my son, Sean, to use this affirmation process extensively throughout his football career. We started when he played quarterback in high school and eventually taught him how to do it in his own. We should try to get him in a very relaxed state of mind through deep breathing and progressive muscle relaxation technique so that he can become very quiet inside. Then I would help him visualize himself right in the heat of the toughest situation imaginable. He would imagine a bl big blitz coming at him fast. He had to read the blitz and respond. He would imagine giving audibles at the line after reading defenses. He would imagine quick reads with the first receiver, his second receiver, his third receiver. He would imagine options that he normally wouldn't do. At one point in his football career, he told me he was constantly getting uptight. As we talked, I realized that he was visualizing uptightness. So we worked on visualizing relaxation in the middle of the big pressure circumstances. We discovered that the nature of the visualization is very important. If you visualize the wrong thing, you'll produce the wrong thing. Dr. Charles Garfield has done extensive research on the peak performers, both in athletics and in business. He became fascinated with the peak performance in his work with the NASA programs, watching the astronauts rehearse everything on Earth again and again in a simulated environment before they went to space. Although he had a doctorate in mathematics, he decided to go back and get another PhD in the field of psychology and study the characteristics of peak performers. One of the main things his research shows showed was that almost all of the world class athletes and other peak performers are visualizers. They see it, they feel it, they experience it before they actually do it. They begin with the end in mind. You can do it in every area of your life. Before a performance, a sales presentation, a difficult confrontation, or a daily challenge of meeting a goal, see it clearly, vividly, relentlessly, over and over again. Create an internal comfort zone. Then, when you get into the situation, it, is, it isn't foreign. It doesn't scare you. Your creative, you create, your your creative visual, right brain, is one of the most important assets both in creating your personal mission statement and in integrating it into your own life. There is an entire body of literature and audio and videotapes that deals with the process of visualization and affirmation. Some of the more recent developments in the field include such things as sub subliminal programming, neurologistic programming, and new forms of relaxation and self-talk processes. These, are involve, these all involve explanation, elaboration, and different packaging of fundamental principles. The first, creation. My review of success literature brought me in contact with hundreds of books on this subject. Although some made extravagant claims and relied on an, 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 anecdotal rather than scientific evidence, I think that most of the material is fundamentally sound. The majority of it appears to have originality come out of the study of, Bible, of the Bible by many individuals. In effective personal leadership, visualization, and affirmation techniques emerge naturally out of the foundation of well-thought-through processes, purpose, purposes, and principles that become the center of a person's life. They are extremely powerful in rescripting re and reprogramming in writing deeply committed to purposes and principles. It's one, one's heart and mind, I believe, that central to all enduring religions in society are the same principles and practices. Clothed in different language, mediation, meditation, prayer, covenants, or ordinances, scripture study, scripture study, empathy, compassion, and many different forms of the use of both conscious and imagination. But if these techniques become part of the personality ethic and are severe from a base of character and principles, they can be misused and abused in serving other centers, primarily the center of self. Affirmation and visualization are forms of programming, and we must be certain that we do not submit ourselves to any programming. That is not in harmony with our basic center of the of that comes of or that comes from the sources centered on money making self interest or any other anything other than correct, correct principles the imagination can be used to achieve the fleeting success that come when a person's focused on material gain or on what's in it for me 
but I believe the higher use of imagination is in harmony with the use of conscious or transcend self and create a, a life contribution based on unique purpose and on the principles that govern interdependent reality. Identifying roles and goals. Of course, the logical verbal left brain becomes important also as you attempt to capture the right brain images, feelings, and pictures in the words of a written mission statement. Just as breathing exercises help integrate body and mind, writing is a kind of psychoneural muscular activity which helps bridge and integrate the conscious and subconscious minds. Writing distills, crystallizes, and clarifies thought and helps break that the whole break the whole into parts. We each have a number of different roles in our lives, different areas of capacities in which we have responsibility. I may, for example, have a role as an individual, as a husband, a father, a teacher, a church member, and a businessman, and each of these roles is important. One of the major problems that arises when people work to become more effective in life, in life is that they don't think broadly enough. They lose the sense of proportion, the balance, the natural ecology necessarily necessary to effective living. They may get consumed by work and neglect personal health. In the name of professional success, they may neglect the most precious relationships in their lives. You may find that your mission statement will be more balanced, much easier to work with, if you break it down with the specific role areas of your life and the goals you want to accomplish in each area. Look at your professional role. You might be a salesperson or a manager or a product developer. What are you about in that area? What are the values that should guide you? Think of your personal roles, husband, wife, father, mother, neighbor, friend. What are you about in those roles? What's, the, what's important to you? Think of community roles, the political area, public service, volunteer organizations. One executive has used the idea of roles and goals to create the following mission statement. My mission is to, mission is to live with integrity and to make a difference in the lives of others. To fulfill this mission, I have charity. I seek out and love the one and each, each one regardless of the situation. I sacrifice. I devoted my time, talent, and resources to my mission. I spot, inspire. I teach, for example, that we all, children of a loving Heavenly Father, and that every Goliath can be overcome. I am impactful. What I do makes a difference in the lives of others. These roles take priority in achieving my mission. Husband. My partner is, one, is the most important person in my life. Together, we contribute to the fruits of harmony, industry, charity, and thrift. Father. I help my children experience progressive greater joy in their lives. Son slash brother, I am frequently there for support and love. Christian, God can count on me to keep my covenants and to, to serve his other children. Neighbor, the love of Christ is visible through the actions toward others. Change agent, I am a catalyst for developing high performance in large organizations. Scholar, I learn important new things every day. Writing your mission in terms of the important roles in your life gives, your balance, gives you balance and harmony. It keeps each role clearly before you. You can review your roles frequently to make sure that you don't get totally absorbed by one role to the exclusion of others that are equally or even more important in your life. After you identify your various roles, then you can think about the long-term goals you want to accomplish in each of these roles. We're into the right brain again, using imagination, creativity, conscious, and inspiration. If these goals are extension of a mission statement based on the correct principles, they will, be vi they will be vitally different from the goals people normally set. They will be in harmony with correct principles, with natural laws which gives you greater power to achieve them. They are not someone's goals you have absorbed. They are the goals, they reflect your deepest values, your unique talent, and your sense of mission, and they grow out of your cho chosen roles in life. An effective goal focuses primarily on results rather than activity. It identifies where you want to be and, in the process, helps you determine where you are. It gives you in important information on how to get there and it tells you when you have arrived. It unifies your effort and energy. It gives meaning and purpose to all you do and it can finally translate itself into daily activities so all you do, to all you do and the activities so that you are proactive you are in charge of your life. You are making it happen each day. The things that will enable you to fulfill your personal mission statement. Roles and goals give structure and organized direction to your personal mission. If you don't get, if you don't yet have a personal mission statement, and it's a good place to start to begin. Just identifying the various areas of your life and the two or three important results you feel you should accomplish in each area to move ahead gives you an overall perspective of your life and a sense of direction. 
As we move into habit three, we'll go into greater depth in the area of short-term goals. The important application at this point is to identify, is to identify roles and long-term goals as they relate to your personal mission statement. These roles and goals will provide the fund foundation for effective goal setting and achieving when we get to the habit number three, day-to-day -day management of lifetime. Family mission statements. Because habit two is based on principle, it has broad application in addition to individuals, families, services, groups, and organizations of all kinds become significantly more effective as they begin with the end in mind. Many families are managed on basis of crisis, moods, quick fixes, and instant gratification, not on sound principles, symptoms, surface, whenever stress and pressure mount, people become clinical, critical, or silent, or they start yelling or reacting. Children who observe these kinds of behaviors grow up thinking that the only way to solve problems is flight or fight. The core of many family is what is changeless, what is always going to be there, shared vision and values. By writing a family mission statement, you give expression to its true foundation. The mission statement becomes its constitution, the standard, the criteria for evaluation and decision making. It gives continuity and unity to family as well as direction. When individual values are harmonized with those of the family, members work together for common purposes that are deeply felt. Again, the process is as important as the product. The very process of writing and refining a mission statement becomes a key way to improve the family. Working together to create a mission statement builds the PC capacity to live it. By getting input from every family member, drafting a statement, getting back, getting feedback, revising it, and using wording from different family members, you get the family talking, communicating on things that really matter deeply. The best mission statement are the result of a family member's coming together in a spirit of mutual respect, expressing their different views, and working together to create something greater than any one individual could do alone. Periodic review to expand perspective, shift emphasis or direction, amend or give new meaning to time-worn phrases can keep the family united in common values and purposes. The mission statement becomes the framework for thinking for governing the family. When the problems and crises come to the Constitution, come the Constitution's there to remind family members of the things that matter most and to provide direction for problem solving and decision making based on correct principles. In our home, we put, back, we put our mission statement on our wall in the family room so that we can look at it and monitor ourselves daily. When we read the phrase about the sounds of, our, of love in our home, order, responsible, independence, cooperation, helpfulness, meetings, needs, developing talents, showing interest in each other's talents, and giving service to others, it gives us criteria to know how we're doing in the things that matter most to use as a family. When we plan our family goals and activities, we say, in light of these principles, what are the goals we're going to work on? What are our action plans to accomplish our goals and actualize these values? We review the statement frequently and rework goals and jobs twice a year. In September and June, the beginning of school and the end of school, to reflect the situation as it is, to improve it, to strengthen it, it renews us, it recommits us to what we believe in, what we stand for. Organizational mission statements. Mission statements are also vital to successful organizations. One of the most important thrusts of my work, the organizations, is that is, that, is to assist them in developing effective mission statements and to be effective that statements have become, have to come from within the bowels of the organization. Everyone should participate in a meaningful way, not just the top strategy planners, but everyone. Once again, the involvement process is as important as the written product and in the key, it, and is the key to its use. I am always intrigued whenever I go to IBM and watch the training process there. Time and time again, I see the leadership of the organization come up in a group, into a group and say that IBM stands for three things, the dignity and individual excellence and service. These things represent the belief system of IBM. Everything else will change, but these three things will not change. Almost like osmosis, these belief systems have spread throughout the entire organization, providing a tremendous base of shared values and personal security for everyone who works there. Once I was training in a group of people for IBM in New York, it was a small group, about 20 people, and one of them became ill. He called his wife in California. He, was expressed, he expressed concern in causing because his illness requires special treatment. The IBM people responsible for the training session arranged to have him taken to an ex excellent hospital with medical specialists in a disease, but they could sense that his wife was uncertain and really wanted him to home, where their personal physician couldn't could handle the problems, so they decided to get him home. 
Concerned about the time involved in driving him to the airport and waiting for a commercial plane, they brought in a helicopter, flew him to the airport, and hired a special plane just to take his, this man to California. I don't know what costs that involved. My guess would be many thousands of dollars, but IBM believes in dignity for the individuals. That's what the company stands for. To those present, that experience represent, represented its belief system and was no surprise. I was impressed. At another time, I was scheduled to train 175 shopping center managers at a particular hotel. I, may, I was amazed at the level of service there. It wasn't a cosmetic thing. It was evident that all levels spontane spontaneously without supervision. I arrived quite late, checked in, and asked if room service were available. The man at the desk said, no, Mr. Kobe, but if you're interested, I could go back and get a sandwich or a salad or whatever you'd like that, you, that we have in the kitchen. His attitude was one of total concern about my comfort and welfare. Would you like to see your con convention room? He continued, do you have everything you need? What can I do for you? I am here to serve you. There was no supervisor there checking up. This man was sincere. The next day, I was in the middle of a presentation when I discovered that I didn't have all the colored markers I needed. So I went up into the, into the hall during the brief break and found a bellboy running to another convention. I've got a problem, I said. I'm here training a group of managers and I only have, and I only have a short break. I need some more colored pens. He whipped around and almost came to attention. He glanced at my tag and said, Mr. Kobe, I will solve your problem. He didn't say, I don't know where to go, or, well, go and check the front desk. He just took care of it, and he made me feel like it was his privilege to do, us, to, to do so. Later, I was in the side lobby looking at some of the art objects. Someone from the hotel came up to me and said, Mr. Kobe, would you like to see a book that describes art objects in this hotel? How an anticipatory, how service-oriented. I next observed one of the employees high up on a ladder cleaning windows in the lobby. From his vantage point, he saw a woman having a little difficulty in the garden which, with a walker. She hadn't really fallen and she was with other people, but he climbed down the ladder, went outside and helped the woman into the lobby and saw that she was properly taken care of. Then he went back and finished cleaning the windows. I wanted to find out how this organization had created a culture where people brought so deeply into the value of customer service. I interviewed housekeepers, waitresses, bellboys in the hotel and found that this attitude had impregnated the minds, hearts, and attitudes of every employee there. I went to the back door into the kitchen. There I saw the central value, uncompromising, personalized service. I finally, Zation developed. I finally went to the manager and said, my business is helping organizations develop a powerful team character, a team culture. I'm amazed at what you have done here. Do you want to know what the real key is? He inquired. He pulled out the mission statement for the hotel chain. After reading it, I acknowledged, that's an impressive statement, but I know many com companies that have impressive mission statements. Do you want to see the one for this hotel? He asked. Do you want me to, do you mean you developed one just for this hotel? Yes. Different from the ones from the hotel chain. Yes, it's a harmony with the statement, but this is one. Per, this one pertains to our situation, our environment, our time. He handed me another paper. Who developed this mission statement? I asked. Everybody, he replied. Everybody? Really, everybody? Yes. Housekeepers? Yes. Waitresses? Yes. Desk, desk clerks? Yes. Do you want to see the mission statement writing, uh, written by the people who greeted you last night? He pulled out a mission statement that they themselves had written, was interwoven with all the mission statements. Everyone at every level was involved. The mission statement for the hotel was the hub of a great wheel. It spawned the thoughtful, more specialized mission statements of particular groups of employees. It was used as a people, as a criteria for every decision that was made. It clarified that those people stood for how they related to the customer, how they related to each other. It affected the style of managers and the leaders. It affected the compensation system. It affected the kind of people they recruited and how they trained and developed them. Every aspect of the organization essentially was a function of the hub that mission statement. I later visited another hotel in the same chain and the first thing I did when I checked in was ask to see their mission statement, which they promptly gave me. At this hotel, I came to understand the motto, uncompromising, personalized service. A little more for a three-day period, I watched every conceivable situation where service was called for. I always found that the service was de delivered in a very impressive, excellent way, but it was always also very personalized. For instance, in the swimming area, I asked the attendant where the drinking fountain was. He walked me to it. But the thing that impressed me that very most was to see an employee on his own admit a mistake to his boss. We ordered room service and were, and were told 
when it would be delivered to the room. On the way to our room, the room service person spilled the hot chocolate and it took a few extra minutes to go back and change the linen on the tray and replace the drink. So the room service was about 15 minutes late, which was really not that important to us. Nevertheless, the next morning, the room service manager phoned us to apologize and invited us to have an either the buffet breakfast or room service breakfast compliments at the hotel to in some way compensate for the inconvenience. What does it say about the culture of the organization when an employee admits his own mistakes unknown to anyone else, to the manager, to the customer, or guest, is better taken care of? As I told the manager of the first hotel I visited, I know a lot of companies with impressive mission statements, but there is a real difference, all the difference in the world, in the effectiveness of the mission statement created by everyone involved in the organization, and one written by a few top executives behind the monogamy wall. Mahogamy wall. One of the fundamental problems in organizations, including families, is that people are not committed to the determination of the other people for their, li- for their lives. They simply don't buy into them. Many times as I worked with organizations, I found people whose goals are totally different from the goals of the enterprise. I commonly find reward systems completely out of alignment with stated value systems. When I began work with companies that have already developed some kind of mission statement, I asked them, how many of the people there know that you have a mission statement? How many of you know what it contains? How many were involved in creating it? How many really buy into it and use it as your frame of reference in making decisions? Without involvement, there is no commitment. Mark it down. Asterisk. It. Circle it. Underline it. No involvement, no commitment. Now, in early stages, when a person in a new organization or when a child in the family is young, you can pretty well give them a goal and they'll buy it, particularly if their relationship orientation and training are good. But when people become more mature and their own lives take on separate meaning, they want involvement, significantly involvement, and if they don't have the involvement, they don't buy it. When then you have a significant motivational problem, which cannot be solved at the same level of thinking that created it. That's why creating an organizational mission statement takes time, patience, involvement, skill, and empathy. Again, it's not a quick fix. It takes time and sincerity, correct principles, and the courage and integrity to align systems, structure, and management style to the shared vision and values. But it's based on correct principles, and it works. An organizational mission statement, one that truly reflects the deep shared vision and values of everyone within the organization, creates a great unity and tremendous commitment. It creates people's hearts and minds, a fame a frame of reference, a set of criteria or guidelines by which they will govern themselves. They don't need someone someone else directing, controlling, criticizing, or taking or taking cheap shots. They have bought into the challengeless core of that organization that that organization is about. Application suggestions. Take the time to record the impressions you had in the funeral visualization at the beginning of this chapter. You may want to use the chart below to organize your thoughts. Take a few moments and write down your roles as you now see them. Are you satisfied with their mirror images, the mirror image of your life? Set up time to completely separate yourself from daily activities and to begin work on your personal mission statement. Go through the chart in Appendix A, showing at different centers and circles, circle all those you can identify with. Do they form a pattern for the behavior in your life? Are you comfortable with the implications of your analysis? Start a collection of notes, quotes, ideas you want, you may want to use as rest resource material in writing your personal mission statement. Identifying a project you will be facing in the near future and applying the principle of mental creation. Write down the res- results you desire and what steps you will need you will will you will lead to those results. Share the principles of habit two with your family or work group and suggest that other that together you begin the process of developing family groups developing family or group mission statement.